Welcome, brothers and sisters. Oh, it's another beautiful day, another time in the presence of God, another time to hear and learn the Word of God. I welcome every one of us to this Surefire Life Conference platform, a platform the Almighty God has given us to make simple, clear, and available the pathway to eternal life. You are all welcome. We want to start right away. So we want to go straight into the teaching of the word. Our topic is growing in the spirit, growing in the spirit. And we have been on this since the beginning of this month. Hallelujah. Our text is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So from this text, I'm focusing on verse 13 particularly because verse 14 is the reason why we have to grow. It is so we won't be tossed about and we will attain and also so that we will attain the fullness of Christ. So from this text, we can say a number of key points that growing in the spirit is about growing to the fullness of Christ. Growing in the spirit is about growing to the fullness of Christ. I want you to just take a moment and uh, imagine something. Imagine that word, the fullness of Christ. To grow, to become like Jesus Christ. Imagine all that Jesus Christ began both to do and to teach according to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 verse 1. I think you should probably look at that so you can remember what we're talking about here. Acts chapter 1, verse 1, Luke, who wrote the book of Luke, also wrote the book of Acts. It says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up. So take your imagination a bit to Jesus Christ in human form, full of the Holy Spirit, as the Bible says, Luke 4, 18, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Glory be to God. Just take your imagination a bit down to imagine all that Jesus Christ began both to do and to teach. Growing in the spirit is about growing to the fullness of Christ. That is who we are to grow into and to do and teach as he did. Praise the name of the Lord. From the text so far, we have made it clear and the text makes it clear that for us to grow to the fullness of Christ, we must be grounded in, number one, the knowledge of the Son of God. And number two, the truths of the faith, the truths of the faith. That is the cardinal truths of the faith. This is not one after the other. They go together. Praise the name of the Lord. Don't forget that. It is not one after the other. They go together. These two go together. So I repeat that, that from our texts, that the scripture makes it clear that for us to grow to the fullness of Christ, which is what God's expectation for all of us, all humankind, is for us to grow to the fullness of Christ, we must be grounded in the truths of the faith, the truths of the faith, what I call the cardinal truths of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. I make that emphasis again that these two go together. It's not one after the other. They go together. Of course, the faith is about the Son of God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
The faith is about the Son of God and how, how deep you are in the knowledge of the Son of God determines the degree of the truth of the faith that is in you. The faith is about the Son of God and how deep you are, how deep I am in the knowledge of the Son of God determines the degree of the truth of the faith that is in you, that is in me. And of course, this also determines the results we get in life as Christians. That is those who believe in God through Jesus Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. So having said that introduction, so what are the cardinal truths? What are the cardinal truths that we are to know, to be grounded in? We have covered, number one, the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. The mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Number two is the church, the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. And again, please mind the term that I use, the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. I will come back to that. Number three the Holy Spirit. Number four, the will of God. Number five, the conduct and behaviors. And if time permits, we will touch on number six. Uh, keep silence about that number six. No, I think I mentioned it. Number six, baptism and holy communion. Baptism and holy communion. Praise the name of the Lord. These are the six points we're going to look at, and we will look deeper in each of them. So we covered last time the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. And I will again summarize. According to Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, that is in verse 2 is where you see that scripture. I just again recite the scripture. It said, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. This was Paul speaking to the people of Colossae, believers in Colossi and Laodicea. He said, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, of course, that then extends to everybody else, right? Verse two, that their hearts may be encouraged, bringing meet together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. I know there are some translations that stays only at the mystery of God. So I use New King James Version that has gone further to talk about what that mystery of God is, that it is of the Father and of Christ. So we made some key points from that study last time. And number one, the Father and Jesus Christ, his Son, the Son of God, are two distinct entities. Number two, that the Father has given his Son as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind, that is, the sins of the world. And those who believe and accept the Son of God, Jesus Christ, receive eternal life. According to John chapter 3, verse 16, we all know and quote it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 14, verse 6. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So the father has given his son as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind, for the sins of the world. And those who believe and accept the son of God, Jesus Christ, receive eternal life. Point number four, that there is no other way for man, humankind, to be saved except through Jesus Christ. Let your faith be abundantly clear and assured that there is no other way for any human being to be saved except through Jesus Christ. Point number five, that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, came in human form, died, and rose from the dead, 
and ascended to heaven where he is now seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. Number six, that the Father, Almighty God, has put all things under his Son, Jesus Christ. There is all power, all authority, all dominion, preeminence in heaven and on earth. Everything is under Jesus Christ. The Father gives eternal life through Jesus. Jesus gives eternal life that the Father has given him to give. You can go to John chapter 5 and you will see that clearly written. Jesus said, as the Father has power to give life. So he has given the Son the right, the power to give life. Praise the name of the Lord. John chapter 1 says, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness. And darkness comprehends it not. First John chapter 5 verse 11. Say, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that has the son has life. So that is the point there. Praise the name of the Lord. So that's the summary of what we captured last Sunday. Today we want to look at the body of Christ. The church of Jesus Christ. And of course you can see the flow. Because everything has been given to Jesus Christ. God, the Father, God Almighty has put everything in his son. His son, Jesus Christ, is in charge. In heaven and on earth. And so... Next, then, is to understand those who are in Christ. Who are those who are in Christ? Those who are in Christ become part of his body, the body of Christ, which is also called the church of Jesus Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. The body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. Let's look at a few scriptures, and then we'll come to make again some very fundamental points, and we'll take the discussion from there. Let's start from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. Emphasis is verse 18. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? 14. So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. 15, he said to them, But who do you say that I am? 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 17, Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon, by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. So for flesh and blood has not revealed this truth to you. But my father who is in heaven, and I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Some translation use the gates of hate shall not prevail against it. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's repeat that verse 18 again. He said, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So take note of that. Jesus said, I will build my church. So question to remember, who builds the church of Jesus Christ? Who builds the body of Christ? Amen. Please. Keep note of that question. Who builds? Or turn it around. Can a man therefore build? From this scripture. Can a man therefore build the church of Jesus Christ? Can a man therefore build the body of Christ? Let's keep that question in mind as we read other scriptures. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's go to the instruction. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1, 12 to 16. And then I'll just jump to verse 20. Revelation chapter 1, 12 to 16. 
Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and gathered about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Glory be to God. I jump to verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So, verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp to edge sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in, his, in its strength. Who is this? Who is this talking about? Glory be to Jesus. Glory be to God. Verse 13, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, seven lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and gathered about the chest with a golden band. So you've seen here the seven lampstands with one in the midst of the seven lampstands. And you've also seen the one who is in the midst of the seven lampstands had in his right hand seven stars. If you remember those three points, the seven golden lampstands, the seven lampstands, seven golden lampstands, one in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, who had in his right hand, or who has in his right hand, who has in his right hand, seven stars, seven stars. Now let's see the mystery of the seven golden lampstand and the seven stars. Verse 20 gives us the mystery. It says, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand. Whose right hand? Clearly that is Jesus Christ, isn't it? Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Jesus Christ. It says, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. It says, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So, Number one, it's clear, Jesus dwells in his church. Glory be to God. Jesus dwells in his church. And he has his ministers, ministering spirits, angels that operate in his church, in his body. Now, Churches are used here, so we will come to that. But take it because you know, are they, you can also ask yourself, are there seven churches? Even as at the time where this was written, were there only seven churches? Definitely not. You can see that in Acts. The churches in the house of uh, this, in the house of that, in the house of so there were many gatherings, many congregations. So what was Jesus speaking to us all who have become part of his body, referred to here as churches? 
it was talking about the different characteristics of members of the body of Christ. And so with that, we will make a distinction. The body of Christ is built by Jesus Christ himself. He said that very clearly. He's the one who dwells in the midst of all those who have come because it's only those who have come to Jesus that become part of his body. And that is the body of Christ and the church of Jesus Christ that Jesus said he will build. So clearly there is no congregation or denomination on its own that re replaces or becomes the body of Christ. But the body of Christ is everyone that has come to Jesus Christ, has come to God through Jesus Christ, has received Jesus, and has been transformed by the Spirit of God, and is living and aspiring and following this growth journey that we are embarking on to become full like Christ. Those are the people that make up the body of Christ. Let's see from the same uh, Ephesians uh, or Philippians that we were uh, reading, and then I will just make the last point and we will have discussion because I believe the scripture is clear. Glory be to God. Let's look at Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4:12 which is where we have been studying, right? He says, uh, let's start from 11. He said, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. I'm starting from verse 11, 12. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Did you see that? Edifying. What does edifying mean? To edify, to build up to train up, to comfort, to develop for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 16, it says, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So the body of Christ is everyone who has come to God through Jesus Christ, has become part of Christ part of that body and that body of Christ is built by Jesus Christ, the one who dwells in the midst of the seven golden lampstand, which is his church. And that's the church Jesus said he will build his body. Praise the name of the Lord. So that makes it clear, therefore, that there is no denomination that replaces the body of Christ. The body of Christ is everyone from every tribe, tongue, nation, people who come into Christ. Let's again look at that from Revelation, Revelation chapter 5. Please look at that with me. From verse 9, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. He said, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll. The translation said to take the book and to open its seal for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. You have made us what? Kings and priests to our God. And these people are from where? It says, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Everyone that is redeemed, saved through Jesus Christ to God by the blood of Jesus 
and they are from where? Out of where? Every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Now, this body of Christ, members of this body of Christ, have need to gather, to associate as a congregation in whatever form, in whatever way. And that's where the congregation comes from. And that's where the denominations come from. But clearly, from all we know today, number one, Jesus Christ builds his church. His church is everyone that has been washed by the blood, his blood, who have come to him, who have come to God through Jesus Christ, has become part of that body. Three, that body of Christ. Members of that body of Christ will gather for a purpose, for the sake of Christ. And that body that is gathering in denomination or in meetings or for whatever ministry or whatever purpose does not replace, you know, become the yardstick of the body of Christ. The body of Christ remains the body of Christ. Two more final points I want to make is that we should know that the body of Christ or the church of Jesus Christ is spiritual, is actually not physical. So that's why Jesus said, I will build my church. So how does Jesus build his church today? By the Holy Spirit conviction, the work of the Holy Spirit, which is why our third point is the Holy Spirit, which is where we'll go to. We'll just read another uh, scripture and then I will pause here for discussion. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. You see Ephesians dealt a lot with the concept of the body of Christ. Or when I say concept, deals a lot with the truth, the revelation of the body of Christ and the unity of the faith. So Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 25. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. This is talking about the body of Christ. He's not talking about the denomination or the congregation. As I always say, that everyone that has come into Jesus Christ is part and parcel of the body of Christ. But not everyone that is in the congregation and denominations is part of the body of Christ. So the denomination gather for a purpose, and that purpose for it to be right should be um, a godly purpose, should be for the sole purpose of Christ and doing the will of God. That's what we are supposed to gather for. Husband, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Who is responsible for making his body the church of Jesus Christ, holy and without blemish. It is Jesus Christ. So it's Jesus who builds his church. Now, what Ephesians then told us, Ephesians chapter 4, is that he has given, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry so that we can learn. We are taught just like we are doing here. For the defying of the body of Christ to build so we are his ministers. He's walking through us, Jesus Christ himself, to build his church, but he's his responsibility. That's why when people say, I don't want to do it, he will continue to build his church. It is a privilege for you to be part of the body of Christ and to yield yourself to his spirit, to use you in any area as listed here, whether as apostles or prophet 
evangelists or pastors or teachers or ministry of any form, any service to God when you have become part of the body of Christ. And it's very important and fundamental that we know this because remember, Jesus feels his body and you, I, who have come into Christ, we have become part of his body and he is responsible. That's really where I'm coming to. It's not about your de the denominations and all that. No, no. It's to let you know that you are part of the, his body. You are a member of his body and you have a duty to contribute to the growth of that body. When you become effective as an individual member of his body, you are causing growth to the body of Christ. And that is why you must again completely understand that that body is totally different from your denominations. And so I had asked a question. So we should answer that question because I've answered all the other questions. And remember the question was, is there any denomination therefore that we can say is the body of Christ? And what is your obvious answer now? No, there is no denomination that we can say is the body of Christ. The denominations gather and they should gather for the purpose, sole purpose of doing the will of God, fostering the ministry of Jesus Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. So I stop here and uh, let's take questions and also your contributions. When we come to begin to then emphasize a number of things that were uh, being taught here by Paul in this scripture, one key one being love. For us to love means we must break down the walls. So those walls that we continually build, we are focusing too much on building the walls. The walls are not the church of Jesus Christ. The walls must gather for a very definite purpose to serve Jesus Christ, to serve the will of God on earth. And we must be clear about that. Nothing wrong with that, but we must focus on doing our duties to equip the saints for the edifying of the body of Christ. And we do that in law. We do that in law. Number one thing is law. That's what the scripture teaches us here. Let's look at that verses uh, 15 and 16 again. So and now we'll ask you to read Ephesians chapter 4 all the way, starting from that verse 11 all the way to, verses, uh, to verse 16. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So don't let those walls become a demarcation. We must break the walls down and we must live in love. Let our lives affect everyone that has come into the body, the body of Christ, which is the church of Jesus Christ. And let our lives continue to bring many more people into the body of Christ and not our walls because our walls are not the body of Christ. All right, that's where we pause. Let's hear your questions and let's hear your contribution. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Um, the teaching is so much. We have, I have a lot to learn from this teaching. It's uh, short, but you brought out a lot of truths for this teaching. So I really have to absorb it to go back again and go through everything. But the the question I want to ask, we are talking about uh, the uh, denomination. And when you are talking about denomination, 
it was easy. My network was very bad. So I didn't quite get it about the denomination. But the question is, what is the purpose of denomination? God has brought it to be, and what is it? It has something to do, you know, in God's agenda. That is one question. And the other one would be on the spiritual aspect of the church. You say the body of Christ is spiritual. Why is it spiritual? Because Jesus will build his church through the Holy Spirit. I hope I heard you well. That's right. So how do you, how do you reconcile this with we the believers doing our own part, playing our own part by the teachers who teach, the apostles who, who start churches or and the mm-hmm. prophets who the, teachers, the, the, the apostles don't start churches. That's exactly what I want us to stop thinking and doing. Okay. Uh, the, so the, so people start denominations and say they're starting churches. We okay. should again clearly come to that term. Church as a gathering unit. Common word that we use, okay? Mm-hmm. Here. And I've said no problem. But that is denomination, right? Apostles' duty, as you can see clearly, is to lead the making of bringing of people, the world as large into the body of Christ, leading that walk. So there may be an apostle that doesn't own a church. And if I just want to be practical, I have some examples, at least my own example. Renard Bonke didn't own a single church, did he? My sister, please answer me. Sister Gertrude, I want a response if you're familiar with Reynard Bonke. Yes, yes, yes. He didn't own a church. He and had a ministry. Oh, I Reynard Bonke, for me, is a clear apostle of the faith. Okay. Leading the building of the body of Christ. That's the man who said Africa, blood, the blood of Jesus must wash the whole of Africa. And he didn't just stop in Africa, everywhere in the world. And he let that walk till he passed on. He didn't own a church. So this is the understanding we must come to. Apostle doesn't lead a building church. So that's, again, the terminology we must come to completely have understanding of. So... The as allocation, I want to use the word allocation, the allocation of the term church to congregations that we have set up by whatever drive we may be driven by versus the body of Christ, which should be the work that we do. Now, once we have that two distinct understanding, then let's focus on the first part, which was your question around that body of Christ that Jesus builds. What is our role? Our role is clear. Once we have that understanding that it is Jesus who has called us and wants us to also do our little part, just use the word little part. Do our best. It's not little. Do our best. Give our all in serving that his purpose. He walks through us and builds that church. That's why nobody on earth can stop the church of Jesus Christ. You know, there have been communities, there have been uh, um, nations that said, no, no preaching of the gospel, no doing of this, no doing of that. Go and check. Jesus Christ himself at times appears to their own sons and daughters. And they become born again. I've also shared the story of the two Iranians. They were girls then, or yeah, you know, that became born again. They have never been to any congregation before in their lives. But they just had the prompting to ask, this God, there must be something more than in fact, like one of them said, he said she was asking, he said, doesn't God hear my own language? Why do I have to pray in another language? Can't I pray? God, don't you hear my language? It started from that kind of prompting. 
from there. Independently, they ended up in Jesus Christ and continued to grow through there. Of course, if I just use their own story, if somebody didn't set up a Bible college for them to go to, because they had to leave Iran and they went to Bible college, learned and then returned. And it was there, they started sharing Bibles and it was reaching so many people sharing the word of God. If they, somebody else didn't set up a Bible college for the purpose of equipping the saints, remember, for the work of the ministry. So the scripture is so crystal clear here what we all who have come into this body are supposed to do. So to, again, uh, summarize if I got your question correctly, the body of Christ is spiritual. Jesus Christ builds it through the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts anybody to repent of sin, and it's the Holy Spirit that transforms any life. Without the Holy Spirit transformation, no, no, there is no amount of what you say beats somebody, kill people that will make anybody serve God, nor be accepted by God himself. And that's why the only identity of a Christian, that one that is a, a member of the body of Christ is the Holy Spirit. So we've made that point. Now, each of us who have come to this body of Christ, that Jesus Christ builds spiritually in the physical, take on our roles and responsibilities. So that's where the gathering comes in. That's where the denomination comes in. But I've noticed that many people have forgotten that denomination is not the church of Jesus Christ. So they have replaced the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, with their denominations. Their denominations is a gathering to equip the saints, to do the work of the ministry, to be the avenue through which many other people are being brought into this body. It is to be... That's why it's called ministry. I like using the word ministry because ministry simply means service. You being a means for God's service so that through that service, people, others come to join the body. So this is where the gathering is important and it's all over the scripture. So gathering is good. The gathering or assembling of them in whatever shape or form for the sole purpose of Christ and doing the will of God. So that's what the gathering is. The gathering of those who have come to the body of Christ for the sole purpose of Christ and doing the will of God. So if I were to summarize all we have said in two words, I would say the body of Christ, which is the church of Jesus Christ, is all who come to God through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who have been washed by the blood of Jesus, as we've seen, from tribes, nation, people, top. Number two, that members of this body of Christ are to gather for the sole purpose of Christ and doing the will of God. That gathering have been called church, denomination, ministry, yes. That's their work. The work is to equip and the people who are in the body of Christ and to continue to be a venue for more, many more people to come into the body. So Jesus walking through them. I hope this clarifies. But we should never make the mistake of replacing that gathering as the body of Christ. We must always remember that the body of Christ is the body of Christ, which Christ himself built. So we are at the avenues. We are his workmanship. That's what the Bible says. We are, we are his workmanship. Apostle, you are his workmanship. 
created in Christ Jesus to do the good work. A prophet, oh, you are his workmanship. You have no power to do anything of your own. I have no power, but we must make these efforts and allow the spirit of God to walk through us for Jesus himself to build his church. Okay, go ahead, man. I saw you were opening the line. I wanted to thank you and to agree with you. <laughs> thank you. So it is very important thank for you. us to have, this, to have this understanding because you should know that as member of the body of Christ, I can actually be somewhere else and affect you. <laughs> oh, that's another dimension because we are part of the same one. Hallelujah. Oh, glory be to God. Glory be to God. And also, as we read in that revelation, that Jesus is in the midst of his church. He is never absent. So he will build his church. He will build you. He will build me. He will continue to build us. According to that Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 and 27 that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. To God be all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll wrap it up here. So if you are if you have come to Jesus Christ and you're still playing those hide and seek and you're still doing that, let me do it small, small. You're still doing all those, uh, you have not yielded yourself to be transformed by the spirit of God to live and walk in love. You are treading a very dangerous path for yourself. All those, so you hear this thing, heaven help those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible. And that's not the principle of God. Hello. So, and of course, you know, people who say that often who want to cut corners, who want to do certain things that, that they, they, they have not fully committed to living a life of integrity, living the full life that the word of God says we should live because um, they lack the understanding of their place in God and in the body of Christ. That's really what this is about. You must come to know your place in God, in the body of Christ. That Jesus is with you, is with his body, and release yourself to be used by him in service to build his body. So would you like to surrender your life to God through Jesus Christ, his son? Would you I'd like to ask God to forgive you your sins and repent of every sin and let the blood of Jesus cleanse you now. Let's pray together. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving your son Jesus Christ to die for the sins of humankind and the whole world. Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me my sins, Almighty God. I repent of them all. Let the blood of Jesus wash me now and make me clean, make me whole. Heavenly Father, give me your Holy Spirit and transform my life by your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. The Almighty God bless you. We will continue the teaching. Take time and uh, let it sink in. So please take time, listen to the um, message again, make your points, because from here, they will be simpler, I tell you. When you have had these two foundational truths clear to you and learn to operate within those foundational truths, the rest will become uh, easier. God bless you, brothers and sisters. This is where we bring it to a close. Bye-bye. God bless you.